All right. Now, uh, you know, number five in the proper in the list of properties of minimum phase filters was this Hilbert transform uh, definition of, of minimum phase. So now I need to go and 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 you and, and explain what the Hilbert transform is. And you know what? I would delete this, but uh, it turns out the Hilbert transform is really useful for exploration seismic attributes. Okay, the simple attributes are are calculated. You using the Hilbert transform, so I think you I think you ought to understand that. Um, and there's even uh, things used in um, uh, <coughs> in um, earthquake networks, you know, where they're looking at um, uh, say the instantaneous uh, amplitude of uh, of the waves coming into the uh, um, into the seismic stations, um, where they're applying some of those same ideas, and they're still Dependent at least, you know, on, on the theoretical side, on the Hilbert transform. Okay, how they actually do it, they may not, they may not uh, actually implement the Hilbert transform, but uh, uh, they're usually trying to find a quicker way to uh, to process a lot of data very quickly. But they're trying to emulate something that that uses the Hilbert transform. So uh, uh, I think quite a useful concept here. All right, so. Um, the Hilbert transform is uh, one of the reasons that it's used is because it's connected to the concept of causality. All right, our definition of a causal waveform, you know, one that does not violate, uh, you know, the causality in physics. Our concept of a causal waveform is that uh, uh, the waveform f of t is equal to zero. It's got nothing in it, no amplitude, no data, for some time t, you know, for, for any time t less than zero. Now you get to pick where zero should be, but uh, um, you know, and that may depend on the physics of the situation. All right. So, you know, looking at a spatial series, um, you know, you, you probably can't define what a causal waveform uh, would would be, but looking at a time series. Yes, you know, there you can define what a causal waveform should be. And so looking at seismograms, which are time series, uh, you know, it's very useful to keep track of, of when you have causal waveforms and when you don't. Because when you don't, watch out, you could be violating the physics of your, uh, that produced your data. Um, now, an interesting thing about a causal waveform is that, you know, I mean, we define the waveform you know, in essence, from you know minus infinity in time to positive infinity in time, and and we only have information for a causal waveform on half of that time, only on the positive half of time. Okay, so uh, uh, you know it's it's uh, uh, it's kind of a uh, and, and of course, in, you know, in your, with your causal seismograms, you're you're only saving the uh, the part of the waveform that's on that that positive half of time because that's where all the information is. Uh, but uh, uh, it's actually uh, an important statement that that you know the the part of the waveform in front of zero time is uh, is all zero. Okay. That's really going to put some some nice constraints, and and allow us uh, to make some pretty wild assumptions eventually about uh, about the waveforms. Now, uh, uh, okay, in developing this, uh, remember that any time series you can decompose according to Fourier theory. You can de decompose into even and odd parts, right? So there are there are parts that are symmetrical. About uh, zero time, those are the even parts, and there are parts that are that are uh, anti-symmetric about zero time. Those are the odd parts. All right, um, and and now given a causal waveform, you know where it has to be zero at negative time, you can make the following statements. All right, for t less than zero, okay. The uh, uh, the time series is zero, which means necessarily that the even part of f at negative time at t uh, is equal to the negative 
of the odd part of f at that same negative time. Okay, f e f sub e of t is equal to minus uh, f sub o o of t. Uh, that's a capital O, not a zero. Okay, uh, at for time greater than zero. Okay, f uh, uh, you also necessarily have uh, the even part of the time series is equal to the odd part of the time series. All right. Now, now uh, this is related to Fourier analysis because in, in Fourier transforming the time series, the even part is going to activate the cosine uh, uh, transform. Uh, you know, in, in our in our uh, e to the i omega t um, Fourier uh, uh, exponential, right? That includes uh, you know under the uh, the the Euler definition of e to the i omega t. That includes uh, cosine omega t on the um, real part, and on the imaginary part, it, it includes sine omega t. Okay, and the sine transform, the sine part of the transform, is what's going to be activated by the odd parts. And now here, you know, for a, all we have to have is a waveform that's causal and obeys physics, and suddenly there's these you know very tight restrictions on the relationship between the even and odd parts. Okay, um, kind of uh, kind of stunning, and I think I uh, this page here is really at the beginning of uh, notes number eight. Okay, and um, so let me shift to that. Okay, so at the beginning of notes number eight on page sixty-six, that's what we were just looking at, and so now I'm continuing in notes number eight, uh, page sixty-seven. Um, so let's let's define. We can actually define that that relationship with the, that we came up with between the even and odd parts at positive and negative time in terms of this signum function. Okay, I mean it's like the you know the sine bit function. Okay, um, and uh, um, so the signum function for uh, at times less than zero is equal to minus one. At times greater than zero, it's uh, uh, it's equal to plus one. Uh, and here's a, a, a you know a detail of the signum function that may or may not be important, uh, and it has tripped up some people in the past. Um, the signum function at zero time is equal to zero. Okay, so that's uh, it's not equal to one. It's not equal to minus one. It's equal to zero. Okay, um, so um, the uh, the even part of the transform is equal. You know, to to come up with these you know corollaries of the waveform being causal of of uh, f being causal. Then uh, what we have is the even part of the uh, of the waveform um, is equal to the odd part of the waveform times the signum function of time, okay? And the odd part of the waveform is equal to the even part of the waveform times the sign signum function of time, okay? And um, uh, now. Um, if uh, this this is actually not true, you know this this doesn't work. If the uh, if the value of f at zero is anything but zero, okay. So there's another you know that's that's where this this signum function being zero at uh, at zero time, um, you know, is is uh, maybe not allowing us to to do as much with the data as we want. But I mean most seismograms right are zero at zero time, right? So at least the physical effects that we're looking at the seismogram, we're okay with that. Okay, so we'll continue. All right, um, let's put this into the Fourier domain. All right, um, and uh, the uh, okay, um, that means uh, uh, the Fourier transform of the even. Notice we have. We have multiplication in the time domain, 
uh, that means that we, if we Fourier trans, you know, I can Fourier transform this equation, right? So the Fourier transform of the even part of f is um, um, is capital F of e. That is the Fourier transform of the even part of, the, of f. The Fourier transform of the odd part of f is capital F sub zero. Okay, we're assuming we get those somehow. All right. And the Fourier transform of the signum function is, as I've written here, the uh, uh, cursive f applied to the signum, signum of t. That's the Fourier transform of the signum function. All right. But the multiplication, right? The Fourier dual of multiplication is convolution. So I got to put in the convolution star there, the asterisk. All right. So, so this first equation transforms to uh, the Fourier transform of the even part is equal to the Fourier transform of the odd part um, uh, convolved with the Fourier transform of the signum function. And this second equation here transforms to the Fourier transform of the odd part is equal to the Fourier transform of the even part convolved with the Fourier transform of the, uh, of the signum function. This convolution, by the way, you know, would be an integral over uh, over omega, right? The convolution is being done in the in the frequency domain, so it's a it's a summation, you know, over omega. It's it's moving the 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 the, the Fourier transform series by each other in uh, in omega, okay, uh, in frequency, not in uh, not in time. Okay, now. Um, we have some additional uh, constraints because uh, not only is f of t causal, it's also only real, right? Because this represents some you know real, real data, and the um, uh, so so we know already, um, you know, from lab one that the uh, the Fourier transform of f f of big f of omega is conjugate symmetric. All right, so the even part uh, we don't have we don't have an imaginary part of f, right? The uh, uh, the even part of f, which is all real, has a Fourier dual with the even part of the uh, um, of the Fourier transform of f, and that's all real too. The odd part of f, which is real, uh, by the conjugate symmetry. Has a Fourier dual. That's what these double arrows mean. Okay, to the imaginary part of the Fourier transform of the odd part. Okay, so uh, uh, you know what started as all real becomes complex. Okay, um, and uh, um, and the even part stays real. The odd part crosses between real and imaginary. So uh, together with with this convolution, here's what we get. Okay, um, the Fourier transform of the uh, uh, of the of the real part, all right, is equal to uh, i times the Fourier transform of the imaginary part, convolved with the Fourier transform of the signum function. Okay, and then the uh, Fourier transform of the imaginary part. Okay. Or maybe this is really the real part of the Fourier transform. This is the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. Is equal to the um, <clears throat> is equal to the Fourier to the real part of the Fourier transform convolved with the Fourier transform of the signum function. And by now you're you're tired of seeing you know this thing here, and you're saying, well, what the heck is the Fourier transform of the signum function? Let's just put it in, okay? And there it is. It's uh, you know. Uh, uh, Claire about probably integrated it out, uh, but I just go to my Shams outline of Fourier transforms and find it, and uh, and it's real simple. Um, so the Fourier transform of the signum function in T is just one over i pi omega. Okay, um, so it's all imaginary, right? Um, that's uh, that's clear. Um, Right, the inverse of i is minus i. Is that right? Um, uh, so uh, 
Okay. Uh, it's always uh, it's always kind of uh, uh, a trip to uh, you know factor i out of something. It's uh, you know <laughs> it's a little weird. Uh, okay. So now let's let's put this into the the definition of the convolution, right? So we'll write out the convolution integral in, in omega here. Okay. And so the real part of the Fourier transform of the F, okay, uh, which is now with respect to omega, is you know we can take out the pi, the one over pi. So it's one over pi times this integral, okay, which is the imaginary part of the of the Fourier transform of F. Um, and our, our uh, I'm using zeta as the dummy variable under the under the integral. You know we're integrating over d zeta. But of course, zeta is 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 on the omega is is in the omega domain. So zeta is just a dummy variable for for omega, right? Because I need to uh, you know I need to put the omega in here. It's f uh, the imaginary part of the Fourier transform um, divided by omega minus zeta, right? So that's the yeah uh, you need that in the in the convolution. Okay, and. Um, the uh, the imaginary part of the Fourier transform is w minus one over pi times uh, uh, the uh, uh, the same integral you know with with the zeta dummy variable in in, in omega okay uh, and it's the real part divided by omega minus zeta so you know this observation led uh, uh, Hilbert I suppose I should look up who he is now we can now we can uh, just uh, uh, Google any, anybody like this, and you'll get the full story, probably from Wikipedia. Um, so uh, uh, presumably Hilbert realized that um, um, that if you define this uh, this this kind of weird uh, uh, integral here, okay, which is really just a convolution, right? You actually have a kind of useful. Um, uh, a useful operator. So uh, uh, he took the real part here and he said, "All right, this integral uh, is going to define the Hilbert transform." Uh, but notice what he did. Okay, he took it back into the time domain. All right, so zeta is now on the time axis. It's a dummy variable in time. And down here, instead of omega, we got t. We're doing the same integral though. Okay. So the uh, the Hilbert transform of x of t actually the Hilbert transform of x along any axis. So you could substitute you know here what we've got up above here is we've substituted omega for t. Okay. The Hilbert transform of x some x some input along any axis is one over pi times the integral you know over all uh, all time or whatever this axis is. Okay, the integral over all time, um, over the whole on the whole axis of that input x of zeta divided by t minus zeta d zeta. Okay, so that's that's a that's you know the definition of the Hilbert transform. So now, if we if if we do that substitution of um, of uh, uh, omega for t, right? The real part of the Fourier transform of f, okay, with respect to omega, is the Hilbert transform in the omega domain of uh, the imaginary part of the uh, um, the imaginary part of the Fourier transform of f, okay, and the imaginary part, right? So now keying from this, we got the same Hilbert transform, uh, you know, buried in there, and not so buried. The imaginary part of the Fourier transform of f is equal to minus the Hilbert transform of the real part of, of the Fourier transform of f with respect to omega. Okay, so so just because we have a causal wave, uh, and just because it's real, okay, we got we got, you know our so our seismograms are causal, they're real, and suddenly we have um, we have this this great Simplification that there's this uh, we can you know if we have the real part of the of the Fourier transfer we can get the imaginary part if we got the imaginary part we can get the real part okay 
Uh, and it's defined in terms of this Hilbert transform. Um, and the, uh, the, the transform is, is linear, OK? Uh, you know, you, you, you get, right, the whole, the whole Fourier transform is the real part plus i times the imaginary part, right? And, and so it's the Hilbert transform of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the imaginary part minus i times the Hilbert transform of the real part, and you, you work the transform through, and you find it's the Hilbert transform of the real part plus i times the imaginary part, which is what it should be, right? Um, so uh, uh, it, you know, it actually works uh, you know, just like these other useful transforms we've described, like the Fourier transform. Uh, it actually works as a, uh, uh, you know, with, with nice linearity. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the full Fourier transform of the, of the uh, causal wave f is equal to minus i times the Hilbert transform of f. So here, you know, here the, the, the Fourier transform is the Hilbert transform of itself, okay, if you like. Um, now we can go uh, uh, a little bit farther, um, which I'll, uh, uh, I'll do right now since we started late, if you can stand it. Um, let's let's uh, see what happens when we Hilbert transform um, the log of f, okay, and and, and you know we'll be answering the question uh, for some time. You know what what you know what what do you do? You know how do you take uh, uh, how do you take a whole time series into the uh, 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 into into the exponent? Here, what we're doing is we're just taking you know we have f at omega. That's one complex number. And we can take the log to the base e, you know, the natural log of, of that complex number. That's no problem. Okay. So uh, uh, here's f is equal to minus i times the Hilbert transform of f. Okay. Essentially, the Hilbert transform of itself. Uh, and we take the log of both sides. The log of f is equal to minus i times the Hilbert transform. And, and if you if you think about what happens with the log operator, it goes right through the transform. Okay. The log of f. All right. And um, uh, and then uh, uh, breaking that down, we have one over i pi, uh, and inside the uh, the integral, the Hilbert transform integral, we have log of, of f in there, and then uh, omega minus uh, 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 zeta, and it's the integrals over over zeta, which is along the, the omega axis. Now let's write um, the Fourier transform um, in polar form in terms of the amplitude spectrum. I also introduced this uh, uh, last time, and the phase spectrum, right? So we got an amplitude spectrum and a phase spectrum instead of, you know, a real part of f and an imaginary part of f. It's just expressing it in polar form instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, otherwise. And so here, you know, we have e to the i phi. That's the phase spectrum uh, at that same omega. Remember, omega is real and it's a constant through this whole equation. So, you know, this uh, you know phi of omega is a real number and e to the i uh, phi is a uh, is a complex number, and uh, and a is is going to scale that. That's a real number. Okay, that's the amplitude spectrum, um, and the component at that one frequency. So the log of f is equal to the natural log of the amplitude at at omega plus i times the uh, you know we're taking the log of both sides here plus i times the phase plus we don't know you know how many times we've gone around the circle. So we got this two pi n uncertainty, where n is some is some uh, uh, n is some integer. You know, could be minus two hundred, could be zero, you know, whatever. Um, so we don't know exactly what the phase is, uh, but uh, uh, there is that uncertainty in the definition uh, of the log. And so we have uh, the natural log of a of the amplitude is equal to i times uh, uh, the phase at omega plus two pi n. And um, uh, now, under the Hilbert transform, we have uh, one over i pi, and then up here is the natural log of a plus i phi plus i two pi n divided by uh, omega minus zeta, and then we're integrating that over zeta in frequency. And um, let's we can separate the real and imaginary parts, right? Uh, just pull out, pull them out separately. So we have the uh, natural log of the amplitude uh, spectrum, 
is equal to 1 over pi times this integral of the phase spectrum. OK, and what does that look like? OK, and then the, the phase spectrum is minus 1 over pi times the, uh, uh, this same integral here right, uh, of uh, the natural log of the amplitude spectrum. So given any amplitude spectrum, we can find the phase spectrum. Okay, and and doesn't this look like the Hilbert transform here, right? And the uh, the combination will be the Fourier transform of a causal minimum phase wavelet. Ah, so we are designing filters. We want we want a particular amplitude spectrum, and now we can Hilbert transform it. And then all we need to define the time series that represents that filter is to also have a phase spectrum, right? And now this is, going to, this is going to give us a phase spectrum of a causal and a minimum phase wavelet. How about that? Okay, Because we can just cut off, right? We can just say, all right, n's, n0, so we can get the minimum phase right there just by cutting that off. Okay, Because we, you know, we can manipulate the phase spectrum easily that way. Okay, So the phase spectrum of our desired filter with our, you know, desire, our designed amplitude spectrum is equal to minus the uh, uh, Hilbert transform of the log of the amplitude spectrum. Uh, or the log of the amplitude spectrum is equal to the Hilbert transform of the phase spectrum. How about that? Um, so this is, uh, this is the first uh, little glimmer you have of, uh, of how to design filters that are minimum phase, you know, given some arbitrary amplitude spectrum that you might want. Okay, um, and and uh, what's one thing you can't do here? All right, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, here uh, we're taking the log of the natural log of the amplitude spectrum. What if the desired filter? You know, what if we have a desired filter where we want to completely cut, you know, all energy at some frequency? Okay, so the amplitude spectrum of the filter that we desire is zero at a particular frequency. Is this going to work in that case? All right. Can you take the log of zero? You can't. Okay. So right away we're finding out. Oh, we've got to have gentle filters. We can't completely. You know, we could we could take it down to one percent, point one percent, point oh one percent, but we can't completely destroy. You know, any particular frequency. You know, we might want to completely destroy all of the sixty hertz noise in our seismograms, but we can't do that. We got to leave a little bit. Okay, or we're not going to be able to find a useful phase spectrum. All right. Okay.